The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 244. It's SummerSlam weekend 2020. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. So many things we can't talk about right here on the first and only wrestling podcast. Uh, SummerSlam weekend, we are recording this during SmackDown on Friday night. The debut of WWE Thunderdome, which was kicked off by Vince McMahon, who looks more like a cadaver with each passing day. I don't know. I don't know what to say. We th- thought maybe they'd shoot like an angle uh, with Vince out there, and I guess they half-assed did with Retribution beating down Braun Strowman. But just creatively, there's no direction in the company right now, as they have uh, no interest in explaining Retribution or paying it off yet. So uh, we have no idea why Retribution is attacking, um, why they're named that, who named them that. Um, any of these things, uh, and they've also decided to take Braun Strowman in kind of like a tweener direction, which always sucks. <laughs> yeah, so retribution would imply like that's revenge, right? Like yeah. someone someone is mad at WWE and is seeking revenge. Yeah, like maybe one of the dozen people that was fired. Sure, right? Could yeah. So is like, is Kurt Hawkins leading this group? <laughs> I think he showed up in Impact, so it's not him. But okay. you know, yeah, no, he did. Um, trying to think who hasn't gone somewhere yet. I'm sure there's plenty, but uh, Rus- Rusev. Yeah, okay, it could be Rusev. Um, there appear to be women in the group. Yep. Um, perhaps it is as CM Punk suggested on Twitter. It is the sons and grandsons and daughters of all of the promoters that Vince. Vince put out of business. Yes, and it's being led by Greg Gagne. <laughs> Honestly, not the worst idea I've ever heard. No, no, it's going to be mu- it's much better than whatever they're eventually going to do. <laughs> Agreed. You get the Von Eric kids in there. There's like twelve of those, you know. Yeah, yeah you could do that. Yeah, sure. Why not? So uh, the Thunderdome so far uh, appears to be a big nothing, but there's an NXT takeover this weekend that's going to go head to head with. Uh, AEW Dynamite, which is running on Saturday this week because it was preempted by the NBA playoffs and et cetera, et cetera. So, do you want to preview TakeOver here? Yeah, that sounds good. We got a. I don't know. It, this feels like this is the 30th TakeOver, and, and maybe it's still because nothing in WWE is exciting, especially right now, but not really feeling the buzz for this one. Could also be that there's an alleged uh, predator in one of the matches that maybe put a damper on things as well. Yeah. Uh, Velveteen Dream is back. They, uh, WWE said they did an, an investigation, but they never talked to his accuser. So that's kind of a shoddy investigation. If you ask me, yeah, uh, apparently there are now multiple uh, accusers, and yeah, their uh, Triple H was asked about it again and said, "I'd rather not talk about it, or I'd rather <laughs> talk about something else because I've already answered this question." And this is not a problem exclusive to wrestling media, but generally, when someone when someone is asked like a good question and they uh, say, "I don't want to answer that," and try to move on it's kind of incumbent on the other uh, journalists who are asking questions to not let him do that. Uh, That's, that would be better than just letting him move on and talking about, you know, whatever. I always think about the interview. I don't know, maybe a year or two ago that Dan Lebetard of ESPN did with the commissioner of major league baseball, Rob Manfred, where, Libertard kind of ambushed Manfred a little bit and asked him, hey, did you know that when this ownership group led by Derek Jeter was going to buy the, the Miami Marlins, that their plan was to just tear everything down to the studs and 
uh, completely dis- tank this organization, and Manfred got all um, upset, and Levitard would ask follow-ups and asked him to answer questions with yes or no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, the, and the commissioner said, I'm going to answer the questions the way I want to answer the questions. <laughs> and it's like, it's this weird thing of like access journalism where, you know, I'm sure Dan Labertard will never interview the commissioner of baseball again. Mm-hmm. And like one of the uh, conditions probably for getting him to go on uh, the show was you know, some measure of editorial control and these wrestling media conference calls with Triple H, like, it's the same thing. Like, is Jason Powell of ProWrestling.net going to be on the next (laughs) conference call after asking, you know, a second question? Probably not. (laughs) Yeah, so to your point, it's, it's in all media, but I always think of that and, like, that's one guy who had the guts to stand up to somebody <laughs> and try to hold his feet to the fire. And he's like, you know, punished for it. So whatever. Anyway, uh, pre-show for TakeOver, Brizongo versus Oni Lorcan and Danny Birch versus Joaquin Wilde and Raul Mendoza. This is a triple threat match to determine number one contenders for the NXT tag titles. Brizongo. Who, who are held by Gee. I gotta look this up. It isn't it uh, Marcel Barthel and uh, 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Because they just because <laughs> they were having a tag title match in the background of the Adam Cole Pat McAfee angle a couple weeks ago. That's right. It's Imp- Imperium, uh Fabian Leitner and Marcel Barthel are the are the That's champions. right. Okay. So Seems like the only one they're doing with anything with in this uh, uh, in this match are the uh, the Phantasma guys, Wild and uh, M- Mendoza, right? Yeah, that would seem to make the most sense if you have you have something sort of invested in uh, El Hijo del, del Phantasma. I can't remember his NXT name. Uh, Man, he's the, doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. He's the cruiserweight champ and. Uh, and yeah, he has his two buddies. Yeah, I, I, it would seem like they would be the team to elevate here. Sure. Um, the aforementioned Velveteen Dream versus John Gargano versus Cameron Grimes versus Damian Priest versus Bronson Reed in a ladder match for the NXT uh, North American Championship, which Keith Lee vacated for no good reason. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be an interesting thing and I fully expect Velveteen Dream to win it. Ah, boy. (laughs) Grimes is a good worker. Gargano's a good worker. Bronson Reed, eh. Damian Priest, good look, good act. Mm, Better worker than he probably gets credit for, but Velveteen has regressed dramatically as a worker in the last three years. Um, I don't think this is going to be like that one ladder match on that one takeover like a year and a half ago that was like a four and three quarter star opener. Yeah, I, my my hopes are not high. Uh, also, I would like WWE to stop booking every every company. Stop booking ladder matches and shows with no fans. <laughs> it's not good <laughs> and it makes me sad. Fair enough. Uh, Finn Balor versus Timothy Thatcher. It's maybe a little okay. bit of a style clash there, but those are two smart guys. They can figure out how to make it work. Yeah, I uh, I like I like both of these guys a lot, and I suspect they'll have a good match. They don't really have much of a story to go into this, other than that they both lost uh, the three way, and then you know failed to qualify for the match. And I guess they were in a match together when they failed both failed to qualify. So. Not a not the strongest story, but yeah, I bet this will be this might be the most uh hard hitting match of the night. Io Shirai versus Dakota Kai for the NXT women's championship. Felt like about two months ago, maybe Io was gonna have a short run and then move up. But uh I guess if they're gonna do a draft in October or whenever again they're gonna do a draft now, um I guess that's still a possibility. But I don't, I don't have a feel for whether or not 
Dakota Kai is going to get a run here, do you? Not really. I mean, she's a heel in the Triple H book promotion, so she has that going for her. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't really feel like she's the type of heel that they build her eye. I know that like they gave her Regal Gonzalez, who is sometimes there and sometimes not. <laughs> um, and like they, so they're kind of doing like, I guess like that's, that's the Sean and Diesel thing, which makes sense because all, <laughs> all they do is book <laughs> people like Sean Michaels or like triple H because you know, that's who's running it. Um, so yeah, I like maybe, maybe they could if, if they, yeah, if they have larger plans for EO, but, it's also one of those things where I don't know who else you put with EO if you beat Dakota here, unless you turn somebody or I guess you can elevate somebody like Mercedes Martinez, but I don't know. Yeah, they did the they did the Tegan match as a throwaway kind of on TV, so it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to go right back to that, but uh, yeah, we'll see about that. Uh, Adam Cole and Pat McAfee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I will say, Pat, I Pat did a pretty good promo on the Go Home Show. wasn't much about like a heel promo, but it was a good promo. So this match might have like the most story built into it. I feel like, or at least interesting story. Uh, so that's a low bar, but. I'm interested. Apparently, Pat McAfee is like trained with, I think, Rip Rogers for like a couple of years now. <laughs> yeah, so, it's really weird. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe he'll be fine. And obviously, Adam Cole is a very, very good wrestler. So, and you can trade. I mean, again, in, in an arena show, you could trade almost solely on personalities and get by with a match like this. I think. Yeah, you know, not being in, in an arena full of fans, it's going to be a little bit more of a of a hike for them. But, you know, I think this could be entertaining. I don't know if it'll be good, but I think it could be entertaining. Sure. And Keith Lee versus Karrion Cross for the NXT title is your main event. They've done everything right with Karrion Cross so far. Yep. And Keith Lee's a babyface champion, so in a Triple H book promotion, so... My guess is Karrion Cross wins the bout here. All right. We will see. SummerSlam is Sunday. Uh, it's hard to get excited about anything in these empty arena shows, and you just know dead crowd, whatever. Thunderdome, we talked about it in passing. I mean, it looks pretty cool, but, like, is a set <laughs> a reason? That, it feels like when Russo uh, took over WCW and made the ropes red. <laughs> And just tried to make it look as much like Raw as possible. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, cool, we got a new set. New Japan has the worst production values (laughs) in professional (laughs) wrestling. And it's the the absolute best professional wrestling on Earth. I mean, they have good lighting. Mm -hmm. But it's not like they have... Their sets are like... When they're Kirk and Hall, they have no set. Right. Like, their big shows are like a metal truss with a vinyl curtain hanging from it. That's like, mm-hmm. that's it. That's it. Like, is the, <laughs> set, is the set enough to get excited about? <laughs> right. Well, like, I will say, I agree. The Thunderdome looks pretty cool. They did, you know, all the pyro, and they have, like, LEDs on the ceiling and everything, and all the lights going. It's cool, but then, like, when the, the show actually started, and it's, like, Vince in the ring with a bunch of wrestling fans on Skype behind him, uh... It's just it's really distracting more than anything else. And maybe maybe we'll get used to it after a few weeks. But I think SummerSlam is going to be a really distracting show for the most part. <laughs> the th- One of the things that's the most distracting to me is that everybody's Zoom background or Skype background or whatever is a different color. So it's like it's not even like one solid uh, visual. It's all broken mm-hmm. up and there's geeks that have flashing lights <laughs> on them and like I don't know man it's it's not good anyway uh, SummerSlam Mandy Rose versus Sonya Deville hair versus hair boy Sonya Deville and Mandy almost got killed this past weekend yeah that's horrifying Um, uh, yeah social media as always was a mistake (laughs) and 
um, yeah, there's some truly just terrible, horrible, disturbed people in the world. And she and Mandy are both very fortunate that they were uh, okay. So I, <laughs> I'm, I'm best wishes to them. Yes. I don't, I don't know where else to go with it from there, but yeah, it's, that was a truly every detail of that story. Like as you read through it, it's just like, oh, like every detail gets weirder and creepier. It's just an awful story. But obviously, thankfully, the ending was the person was arrested and they, they were able to escape. But yeah, that's that was almost one of the great tragedies in the history of wrestling right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mandy already cut like three quarters of an inch off her hair. Uh, so I assume like Sonya wants to shave her head or something. So I assume it's, it's going to happen here. Yeah, that would that would seem to make sense. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, the Raw Tag Team Titles will be up for grabs with the Street Profits, uh, defending against Andrade and Angel Garza. It's the Raw Tag Titles. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Montez Ford was poisoned recently, and mm-hmm. and they've added. Because once again, they don't know what to do with her because they're uh, 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 <laughs> what should be punishingly neg- negligent when it comes to booking talented people. Uh, they don't know what to do with Bianca Belair, so they just threw her back in that group. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, th- this they'll do whatever. I don't know. Mont- <laughs> Montez <laughs> got his big win back on TV already this week, so yeah, they'll probably drop the belts here. Yeah, that makes sense. Apollo Crews versus MVP for the United States Championship. Lashley and Benjamin are banned from ringside. There's no reason that a manager should be beating Apollo Crews for the U.S. title. Well, it, it's good news for Apollo that they're banned because Shelton Benjamin and Bob Lashley have both pinned him in the last two weeks. So <laughs> uh, he should be happy because he's a loser who can't beat anybody besides a manager, apparently. <sighs> Dude, they're so bad. They're so bad at this. <laughs> He's really, really talented, and, like, he's getting better, like, especially (laughs) considering that he has to recite WWE lines. Like, he's not an awful promo, but, like, he will be, he will be back in, you know, he'll be back wrestling on main event in a few, in a few weeks whenever they decide to move the U.S. title off of him. Yeah. Oh. SmackDown is on in the background here, and Grand Metalik almost just killed himself trying to do a uh, Tierras from the ring to the floor on Cesaro. <laughs> Bold strategy. Really bad. Um, yeah, anyway. I hope. <laughs> Imagine breaking your neck on in the first Thunderdome show. Right. But um, I guess they might add a SmackDown tag title match to a pre-show uh, with mm-hmm. Nakamura and Cesaro against, I don't know, maybe Miz and Morrison or something. That's kind of the vibe I'm getting. But uh, as of uh, recording time here, that's not official yet. Uh, Braun Strowman versus The Fiend for the Universal Championship. Ugh. Bald Strowman, more like. That's right. That's right. Worst feud of the year. Um, gosh. Yeah, Seth and the Fiend was last year, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm content in saying, because there were probably other feuds that have been bad this year, but none of them have gone this long. <laughs> so, uh, also, I do think it's funny that in the midst of uh, producing a hair versus hair match, they also just had one other person on the show randomly just decide to <laughs> shave their head. <laughs> type of things that like a quality control or an editor would probably catch on a television show if this were like a real produced (laughs) television show yeah but it's not no it certainly isn't um bailey versus asuka and that for the smackdown women's title and then sasha versus asuka for the raw women's title um how you feeling i the fact that the they've made clear that Bailey is wrestling first really makes me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, like, I could see Bailey losing, and then Bailey screwing Sasha so that she loses too. I I don't know. Like, I just I 
<laughs> I thought maybe so they had Shayna tap Bailey out on uh, Monday for some reason. Right. Um, I, so I thought they were going to add a, a women's tag title match to this show as well. And they're going to everybody's going to work three times except for Shayna. <laughs> um, that, but maybe that, maybe they'll save that for TV. That's that's on the, the pay-per-view next weekend. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I forgot. There's a pay-per-view <laughs> next weekend. How could we forget? Um, yeah, that that really like screwed up. Like trying to predict finishes for these two matches, like uh, the fact that the that Sasha and Bailey are defending the tag titles against Oscar and Baszler in a week, like it's like you can't you can't ever predict what they're going to do anyway. But then right. you really can't predict what they're going to do. <laughs> My thought is Bailey will retain her belt via uh, Sasha helping her cheat. Right. Then Bailey will try to help Sasha cheat, but will fail, and Asuka will beat Sasha. And then, so there will be issues between Bailey and Sasha, and then going into, and then they will lose the tag belts <laughs> to Asuka and Shayna. And then Bailey will still have her belt, but Sasha will be beltless again. And then we get another, I'm going to say a solid eight, another 18 months of <laughs> teasing a breakup between <laughs> Sasha and Bailey. And uh, uh, we, we'll, we'll pull that trigger uh, at uh, Roadblock End of the Line uh, 2023 <laughs> will be when they finally have their first match. <sighs> yeah, I think it's going to be a, um, another raw title reign with uh, zero successful defenses for friend of the show, Sasha Banks. Hello, Ethan. It is your girl, the legit boss, Sasha Banks. What's that, like four in a row now? It'll be five. Oh, okay, cool. Wow. She's the only five-time Raw Women's Champion. She's the only five-time Raw Women's Champion who's <laughs> never successfully descended the belt one time. Yeah, that's a problem. Remember when they made her tap out <laughs> in an Iron Man match with like two seconds left on the clock? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Classic. <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> Dominic Mysterio, Ray's large adult son, will be wrestling <laughs> Seth in a street fight. Well, it'll be something. Ray was back on TV, so. Yeah, he signed. Three so year deal. Yeah, so that's. I'm. I, I don't. I don't know. You have Ray help his large adult son win, and then you continue the. The Seth feud, uh, or uh, that's also a terrible feud this year. But it's it's bad. Yeah, it's mostly just bad because if they just had a regular feud and Seth was a regular heel, it would be fine. But they have saddled him with this preacher gimmick, which he's just not talented enough to pull off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so anyway, but yeah, I could I could see I could see little Dom. <laughs> Little big Dom getting his getting his first win here, and uh, and then we we continue uh, Ray versus versus Seth. I, uh, I I don't know what else they can do to each other. Like they're gonna be like, <laughs> loser gets his arm sawed off at next week's show. The, uh, a testicle for a testicle. Yep, there we go. Yeah, I I I think Dominic's losing. <laughs> Gotta get some heat. Yeah, we gotta get some heat for Ray to get revenge on Seth. For this slow burn story that we're just <laughs> all not patient enough to appreciate. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Just it's not slow burn if you just do the same match for six months straight. No, it's not. And there's never any twists and turns. It's just the the heels always beating. By the way, Ray and Dominic got their revenge on Raw on Monday. Uh huh. They beat the crap out of Seth and and Murphy on Monday. Sure so, did. what are we what are we paying to see on Sunday? <laughs> uh, I guess to watch. It. You know, you say that, but one of the <laughs> they did a giant buy rate for that WrestleMania where the go home show was Triple H and the McMahons beating up Legacy. <laughs> so, and then Triple H went in to retain his title in that main event. So, that, that's like the one time that's ever worked, though. <laughs> Like once yeah, in the like, we want to see him get beat up more. <laughs> Forty nine ninety nine. Yes, yes, yes. That's what happened. And then uh, Drew and Randy for the WWE title 
I guess it was in the Wrestling Observer this week that an idea on the board was Randy Orton and Edge for the WWE title at WrestleMania. Hell yeah. <laughs> Which would mean Randy's getting that belt at some point. But it was also said, well, they're going back and forth on that because there are people that feel you shouldn't cut the legs out from under Drew. <laughs> I love that the show has been built around nothing but old guys for like three months as they do their lowest ratings of all time. But Drew <laughs> is going to be the one that's the sacrificial lamb right. that gets blamed for it. And he's like, well, the, the champion's got to be on top. The champion, the guy, <laughs> he's the guy on top. And he's right. not pulling us out of this. We got to go back to the uh, to the pat hand. Yeah. Look, short and more. I, I like Edge. I like Edge just fine. But they built the Raw after Royal Rumble around him um, coming out at the end of the show, and it meant absolutely nothing for ratings. So, nobody's a needle mover. Edge really isn't a a needle mover. And maybe we should stop building around 46-year-old guys. Yeah, and again, I think there would be an argument, right? If if Orton versus Big Show wasn't there in their lowest rated third <laughs> hour ever until that record was broken three <laughs> weeks later or whatever, like you could make the argument, right? It's it's the Nitro argument. It's like, yeah, at least a reason if we were if we were drawn big houses, but of course there are no fans, uh, and the ratings obviously have not. <laughs> Shane McMahon and his fake MMA have meant more for Raw ratings than Randy Orton being on top hat. So like I don't I don't know what we're doing other than that it's just what we always do so we push the old guys. <laughs> sure, yeah. There's no no argument to be made that we should go back to the old guys. All right, that's SummerSlam. Uh, AEW is going to start selling tickets beginning next week. Ten percent capacity outdoor venue. What do you think? I mean, it's dumb <laughs> <laughs> uh, and bad probably. Uh, I know they've already been like letting people in <laughs> just via temperature checks yep. for like a month now or yep. longer maybe. Yep. So I guess it's like, well, if we're letting people in, we might as well charge them. Um, and I know they're Tony Khan put out something about how they're gonna like legally stop people from buying these tickets to resell them like it has to be like whatever block of tickets you buy it has to be you in your household or whatever i don't i don't know how they <laughs> like enforce that if you check everybody's ids to see if they have the same address or what but like they're claim like i don't know i guess if you're gonna do this this is the closest thing i'm not gonna call this responsible because the responsible <laughs> thing would be to not have anybody come but like they're trying, like they're trying to make it be like, no, no, we're being really safe and careful. But it's like, well, if you really wanted to be safe and careful, you just wouldn't have anybody in there, though. So, right. I don't know, man. I don't uh, like. I don't. I don't know that is a ten to fifteen percent capacity really going to make that much difference in atmosphere for your shows. You know, they've had like a hundred or hundred or hundred and fifty people at Dynamite shows, and they're talking about having five hundred people. And in an outdoor venue spread all over the building, I don't think it's going to make a lick of difference. Yeah. So whatever, <laughs> man. Like, like just don't. I don't know. If you're going to do this, just say it's because hey, we like money and we just want to get as much money as possible. Don't don't lie and say you're giving back to the fans, or don't try to tell me about how safe you're being. Just like no, you just love money and you want to try to make more money because you're not making any money this year. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be that seems to be the deal. All right. Uh I guess last thing here, Renee Young's leaving WWE. Uh we've been doing this show for six and a third years, six years and change. And we've pretty much been talking about on the show for six years, like what is Renee Young doing in WWE? She <laughs> she's so much better in this business. I'm sure she has interest from outside. I don't know. You just want to talk about Renee Young's tenure and uh, her decision to leave. And I don't know. Like, this feels. I know that there's interest in this because I do the YouTube videos for the Wrestling Observer uh, YouTube channel. And anytime there's a Renee Young video, a t- Renee Young is the topic of the video, it does huge numbers. So <laughs> I know people like Renee. 
Yeah. Well, and we talked about this off the air. Like, for the longest time in wrestling, there was a thought, and it seemed to be proven to be true, that, like, an announcer that you know and like was, like, an important part of the presentation, right? Yeah, that's that's such an important, like, integral part of the presentation of pro wrestling over the years. Everybody has these fond memories of J.R. and King. There's a reason Jim Ross still has a job in wrestling in 2020 and it's not because of his talent so um it's that it's not so i think yeah people want to have that host that announcer that interviewer who shows personality who they remember and renee was the best you know the best person they've had probably since mean gene in that company and you wonder how much better she probably could have been in a company that actually was encouraging her to show more personality (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's bizarre so i guess the the line in the observer was it's inevitable she'll do something for aew at some point but i don't know do you see that i don't i feel like that'd be such a step down unless so i mean we've talked we probably talked about this three years ago when they put her as the third person in the worst announce. <laughs> with she was the third person in, with the worst announcing duo in the history of this company <laughs> not in, that did that doesn't involve Matt Stryker anyway um, <laughs> uh that like she would be a fine she probably would have been fine at play by play like i know yeah. she personally has said she hated doing commentary it's like yeah i bet everyone <laughs> who is the third person in a michael cole Corey graves booth probably hates their lives <laughs> um for good reason uh, they're both terrible, like improv partners, and they yell over each other and whoever the third person is constantly. <laughs> so, sorry, this is just a, a diatribe about that on the side here. But sure. like, and I, at the time, I remember thinking, just make her the play-by-play. Let Corey be the color guy. That would have been fine. Like she probably would have been really good in that role. So I think if you're good, and if she was talking about coming full time into AEW, I would be like, make her the play-by-play. <laughs> And let you know whoever two of those three you can alternate if you want with Shivani and Jr. and Excalibur. Obviously, I know who I would want to be out of that booth of those three. But <laughs> um, man, this is just turning into Liam hates announcers. But uh, yeah. yeah, but no, Renee is great. So I like unless uh, or unless you have like a I don't know some sort of featured host role for her. Like, I don't know, because I just, I don't want her, like, the idea of her just being in, like, the spot that Alex Marvez or DDP's daughter is most weeks, like, that would be such a downgrade for her, and not because AEW is lower than WWE, but just because, like, not, she wasn't just doing, she was doing very little interviewing towards the end there, even after she left commentary, she was doing, obviously doing the Fox show and and all that stuff, so, it just seems like her... (laughs) her future is so much brighter than just being a, you know, a backstage interviewer on a different wrestling show. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. I don't know. She's writing a cookbook. I don't know if food network wants her, but they should. Yeah. Uh, If I were ESPN, I put her on their morning TV show with Mike Greenberg and to try to save that mess. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's like, if this were 15 years ago, I'd say Access Hollywood or something, but it seems I don't even feel like those shows are on the radar anymore. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't know what uh, the answer is, but she, I think she's going to have her choice of of jobs. I was going to say if like if it was still relevant, like the day I could see her on like the Daily Show or something as like a correspondent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think she'd probably be really good at that. Um, yeah. So yeah, then, why yeah. Not? Yeah, so I I think she would, and hopefully, yeah, people will be aware of how talented she is. And yeah, I like I said, like she was so good in that role in that where she was clearly not being set up for success. Yeah. So you wonder where if she went to an organization, be that another wrestling organization or maybe something bigger than that, how much better and you know more, how much better she could possibly be at this if if she were in a in a different company so yeah hopefully hopefully she gets a chance to show that and uh and goes on to bigger and better things and also hey maybe if 
uh, one of your really long-term, uh, really talented employees uh, gets COVID during an outbreak. That was your fault. Maybe give her a call. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a thought for any CEOs or uh, COOs or anybody else that might it, be uh, looking for tips. Like, it's total BS that Vince didn't call her and say, how you doing? Or even text her, say, how you doing? It's total mm-hmm. BS that Hunter didn't call or text and say, how you doing? But they have the built-in fail-safe excuse of that's not their job. That's the head of talent relations job. But the head of talent relations didn't either. Yeah. <laughs> which which then begs the question, okay, was he just negligent in, in his job? Or was he negligent in his job because the chairman <laughs> like was shaming <laughs> Renee for, for getting COVID? You know? Like, right. How dare you? <laughs> it's so dumb. Anyway. All right, so enjoy SummerSlam this weekend, everyone. Remember, you'll never see it coming. That's right. And uh, until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Yeah, so Ryan Satin and John Quinones suck. I hate the television show What Would You Do? It's a production of ABC News. It is not a news show. It is some kind of <laughs> bizarre, wacky uh, reality show, and not a particularly good one. It's all about it's all about entrapment <laughs> and putting unsuspecting everyday people in uh, horrible, um, morally ambiguous uh, situations, and asking, "What would you do?" That's right, and it stars television's John Quinones, as mentioned, who is, uh, I think he also does like 2020 or some of those shows. This is really where he shines, <laughs> I think, is what would you do? Well, this is <laughs> at one point in history, his Wikipedia page said that he'd been arrested for pooping in a library, <laughs> <laughs> which I've always know. just chosen to believe as fact. <laughs> And uh, I think he's a big carny. And, of course, it shouldn't shock us that Ryan Satin, the uh, scummiest guy in wrestling media, is a big fan of the show. Think of the ground that covers. But, yeah, uh, (laughs) Sheriff Joe Arpaio's good friend Ryan Satin loves What Would You Do? That's exactly right. So, uh, Fraser. Fraser Observer Radio is back this week as heck yeah. As I've uh, watched uh, a few dozen episodes of Fraser this week, and really, I'd I'd like to direct the conversation to talk of a Fraser reboot, Ooh. which which has been rumored for a few years now. I can't imagine there's any shortage of interest from any of the streaming services that are just always desperate to keep adding subscribers. And it's not as though any of the principals are uh, busy doing anything else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure the the syndication money's good for the for the tip top actors, but yeah, it's not as if a lot of people's peak in show business was after the show, unless you consider playing Beast in X Men Three, Kelsey Grammer's peak, which of course <laughs> I do. But. <laughs> They did like a one of those charity um, Zoom reunion deals a couple of months ago, mm-hmm. and obviously, I mean, Kelsey Grammer's been talking about shopping a Frasier reboot for like three or four years, mm-hmm. and uh, he has not a lot else going on, and he is also uh, divorced a couple of times, and uh, is by the way neither here nor there, but so famously a womanizer that one of his wives insisted that he get her name tattooed on his uh, groin. (laughs) Mm, Wow. 
So anyway, he's not busy right now, but they did one of those charity story. they did one of those charity Zoom calls. And the the most striking thing to me is that Kelsey Grammer looks the worst out of the four principals who are, you know, uh Frazier, Niles, Roz, and Daphne. Kelsey Grammer is probably the oldest and and looks and he had a heart problem like fifteen years ago. Um he looks you know, he's sixty three, sixty four years old. He looks kind of old but everybody else looks like just like a slightly older version of themselves everyone has aged very well and uh obviously the show will be missing a lot without uh frazier's dad you know the great john mahoney passed away but other than that Mm -hmm. let's Mm -hmm. get let's let's get this thing up and up and going here well yeah i mean with with kelsey it sounds like so we might it seems like time is of the essence a little bit and (laughs) I don't know. You you can always like you can shift it. Like, does, did 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 Fraser was Fraser like married or anything at the end of the show? Uh, no. They left it. It was like an open ended an open ended ending to the series. He was uh, he moved to a new city to uh, pursue a, a love interest that they introduced in the final season, but they didn't provide any resolution. Okay. Well. In the very least, we can assume maybe he had a child, and you introduced Fraser Jr. Well, he had a child, twenty uh, year old. He he had a child on the show uh, with uh-huh. his ex his ex wife Lilith from Cheers, um, who would you know pop in every uh, once every season or so. So there is it's there if you want it. Mm. Okay. I'm, yeah, that's that's my idea. We get sexy young Frazier too, and we we have old Frazier just kind of in the background in the in the dad's role. No, I think that would suck. Um, we really just need to keep things. Uh, t- it's just it's all about dialogue and ridiculous sitcom situations and farcical comedy, which nobody else is really doing right now. So I think it would work. Disagree. I think it's about a hunky young man with abs named, named Frisco, and it airs after the sexy Archie show. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, you're c- cutting in and out again, by the way, but all right. I try to keep on keeping on.